night's such an important night. Last night we, we looked at what the, the cup was about, but tonight we're going to look at the cup coming on Jesus. And so the title of this message tonight is called The Burning, Behold the Burning Bush. And if I can't see you because of this laptop, please move where I can see you. It's important for me to be able to see your faces. Behold the burning bush. Oh, brothers and sisters, a burning bush drew Moses. Do you remember? He, he's just caught by the peripheral vision of his eye. He saw a bush burning. And that was unusual. He's an old, broken man, 80 years old, on the backside of the deserts of Midian. And he's walking along, and he sees a burning bush. And he's drawn to the burning bush. And if you were with us last night, you learned what that burning bush was. It was a type. It was a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross, drinking the Father's cup. But let me tell you, a burning bush drew Moses. A burning message will draw hearts. It will draw hearts. God wants to fill you with a burning message. This is not my message. It's God's message. It's been in the word all along. As Pastor Robin said, it's a forgotten message. It's not a new revelation. It's as old as the Bible. And really, it's as old as before the creation of the world from the covenant of redemption when God the Father asked his son to become a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But if a burning bush drew Moses and a burning bush will draw human hearts, a burning church will draw the world. We need to see our churches alive and on fire with the fire of God that comes from having the cross and the lamb in the center of the church. And so tonight I ask you, just as God said to Moses, I don't mean literally, don't take your shoes off literally, please. Well, you can if you want to, but, but God told Moses, take your shoes off because he stood on holy ground. And anytime we look at the Father's cup, it's holy, holy ground when we behold the lamb it's holy ground when we behold the one who became a burning bush it's holy ground and so what i'm really saying to you is may we come with a sense of reverence and awe as we come to the foot of the cross but even before we climb the hill of calvary I believe God wants to do something in our hearts tonight first. So right now, I ask you, Lord, I ask you to move among us. I ask you to call forth those who really need a healing in their heart. And I ask you to supernaturally, I believe, Lord, that you showed me that you were going to supernaturally fall on people and heal their hearts where they've tried to get healed before and heal their hearts so that they can really behold the Lamb. And really even dare to open up their hearts, to have their hearts pierced. I ask you to wipe away every other scar, Lord, and scar their hearts with a revelation of the Lamb of God. For your sake, Jesus, Father, for your sake, that your Son might be glorified on this earth as he is glorified in heaven. So glorify your Son tonight, Father. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 52 and 53, it says that he was disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness, like one from whom men hide their faces. But I'm asking you tonight, don't hide your face. Look him full in the face. And we're going to take a moment now to look into a very painful scene in the life of Jesus at the cross or just prior as he was prepared as a lamb, a lamb that was cut up in pieces to be prepared for the sacrifice to go down on the altar. And I ask you not to hide your face. Many people didn't even go to the Passion of the Christ movie because they didn't want to hurt. Well, if he could hurt like that on the cross, can we take a few minutes to hurt with him again, to feel what he felt, to enter into, as Paul said, to fellowship with his sufferings. Bible says he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment, that's the cup, 
of wrath. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. That's the NASB version, New American Standard Bible. By his scourging, we are healed. And then, when the nails were, or the spikes, really, you can't just call them nails. When the spikes were being driven through his tender hands and feet, do you know that the Greek tense there, when he's speaking, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they, they're doing. It's in the continuous tense. So with every driving force of the, of the hammer, that sledgehammer, he was saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Why was he saying, Father, forgive them? Because... He had already forgiven them. Now, I want to take a moment because I want us to enter into that healing that he endured for us through the scourging. And I know after last night, and I just know human nature, we need it. We need it even more than we sometimes realize. So I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is going to touch you where you sit right now or if you're watching right now. That God is going to touch you. Because your heart has been made tender just watching the scourging that he's, he's endured for your sake, for your healing. How many of you now in this room or watching can say, I've been through some pain. And yes, I've tried to forgive. But I can still feel an ache. I can still feel some pain. Can I see your hand right now? It should be a lot of you, and it is. God wants to touch that pain. And if you would, I don't want to expose anyone, but I'm just going to ask you if you'd stand. And anyone else who needs to stand, please stand right now. I want to ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Let's begin. I want to show you one more thing that's so important. Do you remember this obscure story in the book of Numbers when the children of Israel were being bitten by fiery serpents and they were dying and God gave the prescription, he gave the answer, he showed them how to be healed. Look what he said in Numbers 21 verse 8. It says, and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole and if a serpent had bitten any man when he looked to the serpent of brass but notice how he looked attentively expectantly with a steady and absorbing gaze he lived now if you look at the serpent on the pole and you say yeah but obviously that's a, a picture of christ on the cross but how could that be how could Jesus be compared to a serpent? Because the serpent was filled with venom. And on the cross, Jesus Christ would be filled with the venom and poison of our sin in our place. And he said, God said, the way you'll be healed is if you look, if you'll behold the lamb attentively, expectantly, with a steady and absorbing gaze because there's power in beholding the Lamb. There's power in beholding the cross of Jesus Christ. And when I say cross, I don't mean two stakes of wood. I mean Him. I mean the Lamb of God Himself. So right now I want to ask you, if you would close your eyes and let's behold the Lamb. Let's look up at Jesus. Just close your eyes and picture him. Picture the, the wounded one, the wounded son of God, with again, with that blood flowing down his head, flowing down his cheeks, mixing with tears and spit as soldiers are spitting up in his face. And the blood is, is pouring into his ears, his eyes, his nose, his mouth. He can't wipe it away. Because his hands are spiked. They're fastened. They're riveted to a cross. Behold the lamb. See the blood pouring down from those spikes. Down his arms. See his chest opened up. His back you can't quite see. But his shoulders and his chest is opened up from that Roman flagellum. His legs. His feet bleeding from the spike in his feet. Look at his blood. Look at his wounds. Are you looking? Can you see him? Can you behold the lamb right now? 
Now, with your eyes on him, tell him. Talk to him a minute. Tell him how much you hurt. How much you were hurt when that happened. Just tell him. Jesus understands. Say, Jesus, I felt so rejected. I felt so abandoned. I felt so abused. I felt so tossed aside and stomped on like my heart had been torn out and stomped on and kicked to the side of the road. Jesus, remember, he felt every bit of that pain and more. Tell him how much it hurt you. You may be watching right now, but tell him. Tell him how much this hurt you. Behold him. And then, would you tell him, I'm trying to lead you through some healing right now by beholding the lamb. Would you just tell him how angry you are about it? Admit it. Oh, you're a Christian. We can't be angry. Well, we stuff it down inside. Jesus, I ask you to touch the grief of the pain that's in every heart right now and ask you to pour your love into that grief right now. Touch the grief that's been buried that, that men and women, young men and women, old men and women don't even know. The grief is still there, but touch it now. Holy Spirit, touch that grief. Touch it. Just put your hand on your heart. And, and if you relate to this at all and you feel like you've still got some grief inside, it's not necessarily over the death of a loved one. It might be. But over the death of a relationship or something painful that happened, Jesus, I feel this grief in me and I need to let it out. Would you help me, Lord? By beholding the Lamb. But let's go a step deeper and let's say, Lord, I admit I'm still angry about it. See, when we have grief inside, we can't fully get rid of that unforgiveness. So we've got to let, we've got to be real with God. Just tell Him right now. Say, Lord, I'm angry. I have rage. I confess it as sin against you, Lord. I confess the bitterness as sin against you, Lord. The judgment as sin against you, Lord. Even murder, because hatred is as murder. I confess the hatred, Lord. I confess the murder as sin against you. And I openly confess it. And I ask you, Jesus, wash me now. Wash me in your blood. Just say that to him, to him right now. Wash me. Wash me, Lord. Wash me, Lamb of God, in your powerful blood. Even the youngest in this room need this. Wash me in your blood. Wash me clean. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. From all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. But let's go a step deeper now. Holy Spirit, woo over us. Move over us, Lord. We need the power to forgive. I know we're always told, well, just it's an act of your will. But I'm telling you, we need help. We need help from God. We need help from on high. So would you just reach your hand out to the Lord and say, Lord... Holy Spirit, come. I am powerless to forgive. Say that to him. I am powerless to forgive. But I ask you to give me the power. Breathe upon me, Holy Spirit. And give me the power to forgive right now. And just receive from the Lord right now. Receive his power to forgive. And then with his power, his strength, say, I forgive. I forgive that one. I forgive that church. I forgive my dad. I forgive my mom. I forgive 
my child, my pastor, my whoever it is you need to forgive. That boy, that girl, I forgive. Lord, I forgive with your power. I can't do it in my strength. But let's go a step deeper. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. The reason he said Father is because he had already forgiven. He was asking his Father to forgive. But you know what we say down deep? We may not say it out loud, but we're thinking, okay, God, I'll forgive them, but you get them. You get them. No. We're going to say right now, we're going to say Father. Would you say that? Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her. Father, forgive. Release them to the Father right now. And now you say, I bless him. I bless her. I bless them. I bless them. And I ask you to bless them, Lord. And Lord, I ask you, I rel- I for- this may sound funny, but I, w- I want you to say this. I forgive you, God, for allowing this to happen. It's not your fault. And if you think about it, it is not God's fault. It's sin. It's Satan. It's not God. God came to give life more abundantly. Receive and forgive and bless. And walk in that. Walk in that daily. So Holy Spirit, I ask you to continue. I feel him so strongly in this room. I ask you to continue to woo over us tonight, to complete this work, to do a mighty deep healing work because by his wounds, his scourging, we are healed. Amen. And I hope some of you, and I believe some of you, really got touched and got a a healing or at least the beginning of a healing. You can sit back down. There's power in beholding the Lamb. Now think about it. I'm telling you, the cross either hardens us or softens us. One thief beside Jesus softened when he looked at Jesus. The other hardened. Because that's what happens when we look at the cross. Hearts will either harden or they will soften. It's like the sun. It melts wax or it hardens clay. What is your heart made of? Is it wax or is it clay? Does it soften when you look at the lamb or does it harden? I'll tell you, there's so much power in just beholding, beholding Jesus. Don't forget it. Walk in it. Live in it. Charles Spurgeon said the cross is God's hammer of love wherewith he smashes the rock of hard hearts. We don't even realize it, but our hearts do get hard sometimes. I want to testify of a time my heart got hard. I told you last night about how God just melted me and broke me open and over the cross and over the Father's cup. So for the next 10 to 15 years, I was teaching and writing and everything, meditating on the cross of Jesus Christ. But I got so used to it that something inside of me, it just became rote and One time I was on television and I watched the video of it. And I looked at that and I smiled when I talked about the cup. I smiled when I talked about what Jesus endured. And I was watching that and I thought, what happened? What happened to me? I've lost that tenderness. I've lost that passion. I've lost that something my heart had hardened. I taught it so many times, spoken it so many times. And honestly, probably for the first 10 or 15 years, nobody cared. Nobody listened. Nobody wanted to hear it. They didn't understand. Dr. Sandy, why are you so caught up with this message of the cross? I couldn't help it because my, I still felt the burning on the Lord when I would prepare a message. And it always took me to the cross. And yet, when I would give it, there was no passion in it. So I watched that video. And I'm telling you. Brothers and sisters, I, I was so broken. I repented. I, I repented on my face. I fasted. I prayed. I was determined I was going to fast until my heart softened. And after three days, I didn't know how long it would take. I just knew I was going to fast and pray and repent until my heart got soft again. And it got soft. 
and the passion returned. And that was 15 years ago. And I've never lost the passion. I've never lost it. But listen, I understand it. Some of you may not like hearing me say this, but, but there's a lot of TV, not a lot, but there's some TV preachers that tell you you don't need to repent anymore. It's already finished at the cross, but I'm telling you, we don't even realize the things that slip in. I want to urge you, run back to the cross. Paul said, I rejoice that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. It's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And when God gives us the gift, it comes from heaven. It comes from the Lord. It changes everything. It transforms us. Don't walk away from repentance. See it as a blessing, as, a, as something God has given us. He's given his people, not just when we got saved, but whenever we need a transformation, a change, or he's trying to break through to us. Don't turn away from repentance. It's powerful. I've seen alcoholics delivered because they got on their faces and repented. I've seen drug addicts delivered because they got on their faces and repented. You say, oh, no, just cast it out of me. Oh, yeah, that's the easy way. Repent. Get it out. And the devil doesn't have anything to hold on to, and it's easy to, to, let, to make him go by the power of the blood. But we have to do our part. Run back to the cross. You see, Peter, when Peter just looked at Jesus, he, he, he denied the Lord, and then Jesus turned and looked at him. And what did he do? The Bible says... That as soon as Jesus looked at him, he heard the rooster crow and he went out and wept bitterly. He wept and wept and wept on his face in that godly sorrow. But godly sorrow is what opened him up and, and prepared him. And he's the one God used at Pentecost, the greatest revival in history. At Pentecost, to preach so powerfully the gospel that the Bible says they were cut to the heart. You see, if you want to be a revivalist, I mean this with all my heart. If you want to be a revivalist and carry the fire and carry the message of the cross with heart-piercing power, let him keep repentance alive in your heart. Don't ever get too, too big or too good or too hard for repentance. Jesus gives it to us as a gift. Amen. And so now look back up at Jesus as the filthy mass of human sin falls down upon him. Darkness covers the earth for three hours. He spoke three times the first three hours. But from noon on, it turned dark. And the darkness of sin came the, upon him. The sun hid its face. All nature seemed to stand still as God took all the sins of humanity and poured it down on Jesus. And I know you know this, but that's where we stop. We've got to go deeper. We've got to go higher. We've got to look at what happened. When God made him who had no sin to be made sin for us, like that serpent lifted up on the pole, infused with the venom of our sin, so that all who would come and look upon him and behold him deeply with all of their hearts would be transformed. Just as John the Baptist said, he said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, takes it away through him, through Christ. But how did he take it away? You see, all this time, Jesus, I believe he was thrashing under the, the gruesome weight of this dark sin that's come upon him. It's, it's beyond physical pain. Oh, yes, the wounds, they're bleeding and cutting open on his back, rubbing open, scraping open on the back of the cross, but it's more than that. It's, it's more than physical pain. That just scratches the surface, surface. Jesus is thrashing under the weight of the filth of our sin. But suddenly, something happens. Jesus' body stiffens. He turns rigid. What is happening to Jesus? Look at him. Behold the lamb. His face pales. His eyes filled with tears, bulging with tears, are bloodshot and red. He braces himself. As he looks up, 
and he sees the father tip his cup over him. The father's cup. I think just about all of you were here last night. But remember, remember what that cup is. We looked at it last night. So let me remind you of a few of the scriptures because the Bible interprets itself. It says in Jeremiah 25, 15, Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. The wrath of God was in that cup. The Bible says in Jeremiah 51, 22, See, I have taken from your hand the cup that made you stagger. The goblet of my wrath. The wrath of God was in that cup. Furthermore, it says in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, we considered him stricken of God, smitten by him, and afflicted. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment that we deserve was in that cup. As the father tips his cup over his beloved one with anguish in his heart like we cannot comprehend, the father tips that cup and down tumbles the eternal wrath and judgment wave after wave after wave of God's punishing fiery blazing wrath burns down upon the innocent lamb of God you remember all those times that lambs were, were laid on the altar in the old testament and there were times when heaven opened and the fire of God came down well that was a fire coming down on the lamb but it was just a picture of what would happen to his son. That's why the whole Old Testament tells us about the lamb. It's there. It's all there. It's hidden. It's a revelation of the lamb. Every page is sprinkled with the blood of the lamb. The Bible says in Psalm 42, 7, All your waves and breakers have passed over me. The waves were the waves of God's holy, punishing wrath. That was in the Father's cup. As Jesus Christ, God's eternal beloved one, was engulfed, consumed by the wrath of God. By the very punishment of hell. Remember, or let me tell you this story that I think helps illustrate what I'm trying to say. One day a train came early. It usually came in the back, as it ran through the railroad tracks, it was the back of a, of a little farmyard down a ravine. The railroad tracks ran. But every day the mother, who had five children, would, would listen for that train whistle. And when she heard the whistle, she knew to look quickly to make sure all five children were safe. Well, one day the train came early. And she looked quickly for her children. She found four of them in the backyard playing ball. But where was the little one? Where was the toddler? Where was the three-year-old, the two-and-a-half-year-old? Where was he? He was always going off and, and kind of, he was such an independent little, little child. She looked all through the house. She looked all through the yard. She couldn't find him anywhere. And the train was coming. And so she ran to the back of the yard, looked down over the ravine, and there he was, sitting in the middle of the railroad tracks. This is a true story. I heard a pastor tell this story about a woman in his church. Back in, the, back in the, about the 50s, 1950s, there was the train coming. There was the little boy sitting in the tracks, just playing oblivious to, to what was around him. The mother is screaming and flailing her arms and calling to her child. And the little boy looks up, seeing his mother, but not understanding. And then just as he looks up and sees the train coming, he freezes. He doesn't know what to do. He's, he's just a toddler. The train comes closer and closer. The mother is running as fast as she can to get there, but she can't make it in time. She sees that the only way she can save her child is to throw herself in front of the train and push him out of the way. She gives a, a loud howling scream and then throws herself in front of the tracks and pushes her little boy out of the way and takes the full crushing weight of that train upon herself and dies. That's what Jesus did. He stood in your place. He came all the way from heaven. He tore down to this earth. He came down and threw himself on a cross and took the full crushing weight of the wrath of God, of the punishment of hell that we deserve. 
If you're saying, oh, I don't know about hell being on Jesus, well, you're just going to have to get the, the video from last night or read the books because I'll explain that there and quote men like Jonathan Edwards who said he took the full weight of the equivalence of hell or Charles Spurgeon who said all hell was distilled within that, in that cup or the scripture I'll show you right now as, as we stand back and watch this bush burn, the burning bush. You see, that's what's happening now. Jesus Christ is becoming that burning bush, the fulfillment of the burning bush, the fulfillment of the Sodom or the fire and brimstone that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, the fulfillment of the lamb, that burnt offering lamb that was cut and flayed in pieces and cast out on the altar every morning at nine in the afternoon and every afternoon at nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. Jesus Christ went down on the altar of the cross. What time? Nine in the morning. What time did he die? Three o'clock in the afternoon. The lamb was cut and flayed in pieces and cast down on the altar, which is what has happened to him. And now the fire of God has come down upon him. Behold the lamb, the Passover lamb that was skinned. Its blood poured out and then lifted up on a pole. Christ was lifted up on a pole. That's what's happening now. As he is fulfilling these types of the Old Testament and becoming the lamb who endured the wrath of God, the punishment of our hell, and is cast now into the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, which is the picture of what would happen to him. As the, I mean, it was true. All these happened, things happened in the Bible, but it says in 1 Corinthians 10 that these things happened for us, that we would know what Christ did. And now he's cast into the furnace of God's holy wrath against sin. Remember that scripture I gave you last night. Jesus said these words. He said, I have come to bring a fire upon this earth and how I wish it were already kindled. And that's speaking of the fire of revival that we all love and we want, we hunger for. But then he said, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. Right now on the cross, Jesus is enduring that baptism. His baptism was the cup of his wrath. His baptism was the fiery wrath of God coming down upon him, the punishment of hell that we deserve. He had to undergo that baptism of fire so that we could undergo a baptism or experience a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, the fire of revival. So don't take it lightly when God pours his presence upon you. Remember, it cost God everything. It cost him everything when he drank that cup. Revelation 14.10 shows us unquestionably what was in that cup. And this is what happens to all those who, re who refuse Christ, who reject Christ. Even though he stood in the way for everyone, not everyone will receive him. But it says in Revelation 14.10, the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Because Jesus already took that cup. We don't have to drink it. As we saw last night, he looked into that cup and saw you. Saw what would happen if he didn't say yes to the cup. Yes, Father, I will drink that cup. But he did it for us. Do you see why I say this is a neglected message? It's got to be recovered. It's got to be restored. And it's for you to restore it. I'm 69 years old. I'm running as fast as I can. But you're younger. Please take this message in whatever way you can and reveal it. Reveal it to the church. Reveal it to the lost. Bring him the, the glory he deserves for drinking the Father's cup. You may say, I can't. I don't know how. Yes, you do. God has given you something. He's given you something that you can use. And so as Jesus is enduring this wrath, of course, some of you may be saying, oh, what is wrath? Here's a definition. It is God's deep, violent, and intense judgment against sin. And you know, in this postmodern era, there's so many today say, oh, there's no such thing as sin. I don't believe in sin. We can't. I mean, if they say that, they're denying what he did on the cross because Jesus endured our sin and then took the punishment to eradicate it for those who would receive him. 
But what is this violent wrath? Let's look at it a minute. It is infinite wrath. That means, infinite means it reaches forever and ever and ever. It never ends. His wrath was infinite and it was all rolled together in this one cup, condensed and poured down on Jesus. His wrath was eternal. That means it lasts forever. And yet it was all rolled together and condensed in this cup that he drank there on the cross. It was accumulated wrath for all humanity. All distilled within that cup. Distilled does not mean diluted. It means, you know, like condensed, thickened within that cup. We've got to realize what this means. We'll never be the same if we'll let this hit our heart. I know we understand to the point of we say, well, I know that, yes, Jesus, yes, he took my wrath, but, but we've got to let it hit our hearts. We've got to let it come inside and touch us and transform us from within. And I know some of you might be sitting here thinking, and especially those that might be watching, you might be saying, I don't want to hear about the wrath. I don't want to hear about hell. I don't want to hear this kind of stuff. Listen, Charles Spurgeon said, to take away the substitution of Christ on the cross. Now, do you know what he means there? Substitution means the one who threw himself in, in, in our place, like the woman who threw herself in front of the train, and she became the substitute for her child. Christ became our substitute. It means the same thing as drinking the Father's cup for us. And so Charles Spurgeon said, to take away the substitution of Christ on the cross, you will have disemboweled the gospel. Disemboweled it. Gutted it. Taken out the power. If we take the substitutionary work, the Father's cup, out of the gospel, oh, turn on your TV and we'll, say, I'm, we'll hear people say, I'm preaching the gospel, and they never once mention the real gospel. I'm going to talk to you about the blood-drained gospel on Sunday night. But what is the gospel? We cannot disembowel. I love that word. Charles Spurgeon is so graphic as he talks about gutting the, the truth out of the gospel. And he fought for that in his day. He fought and it really ended up taking his life. He fought so hard for that truth. And that truth is rarely heard in our day anymore. I know what, what we think, though. We don't want to hear about wrath. We just want to hear about love. Don't tell me about hell. I just want to hear about the love of God. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, we will never understand the love of God fully until we understand the wrath of God. You can see that, can't you? Once you realize how much he gave for you, you understand how much he loved you. That's why the Bible says that simple, wonderful verse, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. To understand love, we've got to understand what he did. And here's a terrific definition of love. Do you know how to define love? Here's how you define it. According to 1 John 4.10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and gave his son, to be a propitiation for us. Now you say, but, but propitiation, that's too big a word. Well, it's not a theological word, so don't dismiss it. It's a Bible word. It's, the problem is many of our modern versions don't even use that word anymore. But I want you to see what it means because it's all through the, the New Testament. It's in Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, 1 John 2.2, 2, 1 John 4.10. It talks about propitiation. What is propitiation? It's what that little mother did. It means a sacrifice to avert wrath. Wrath was coming toward us. Jesus stood in the way, took it on himself, absorbed it into himself, and averted it from us. And, oh, one of the best theologians of our day, Wayne Grudem, in his wonderful systematic theology book, he says this. He takes that definition even deeper. He said, Propitiation means a sacrifice to avert wrath and turn it into favor. Favor. 
You know, we love to walk around saying, I got the favor of God. I got the favor of God. But please remember what gave you that favor is he became the substitute, the sacrifice lamb and uh, took the wrath on himself to give you favor and grace and blessing and abundance and love. And, and the list is endless of the peace and the joy and the goodness of God that he pours out because of what he took in our place on the cross. Can you believe it? Oh, I know you can. This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for us. So right now, I want you to picture yourself standing before God and the wrath of God is getting ready to, to rush down upon you and punish you. But I was a good person. But Jesus said, no, Father, don't punish her and don't punish him. Punish me instead as he takes that wrath upon himself and is punished in our place. Our beloved Savior took it all on himself. Here's another example. A beautiful young man, his name was Private Ross McGinnis, true story, from Iraq. He was riding his Humvee, I think that's a little Jeep, through, through uh, Iraq. And some of his men, he saw three of his best buddies over beside the car, and suddenly an insurgent threw a hand grenade down in front of these friends of his. He was sitting in the car. He could have gotten away. He didn't have to take what he did. He saw that grenade. He jumped out of the car and threw himself. This is a true story. Threw himself on top of that exploding grenade. And his body exploded. And he died right there in a pool of blood. But he saved those three men. That's what propitiation is. Jesus took the grenade of the Father's wrath upon himself. And turned it into favor that we sure don't deserve. Turned it into mercy and love. Do you see why I say we can never fully understand the love of God if we don't understand the wrath, the wrath of God that he endured in our place. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated. This is the greatest demonstration of love ever seen in heaven or earth. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us you know we use that phrase so lightly oh you need to get saved Jesus died for you but why don't we just tell him a little bit more that's too that just doesn't tell the story tell it fully tell it tell them what he did when he drank the father's cup tell them how much he loves them that he took their punishment find a way through your own words because there on the cross, Jesus paid it all. It, I believe that it's only when we see the Father's cup that we can fully understand the breadth, the depth, the length, and the height of the love of Christ through understanding what he did for us. So I want you to look. Try to lift your eyes even higher than the cross for a moment. Imagine that cup in the Father's hand, trembling in the Father's hand. How do you think he feels? Have you thanked him for what he did when he poured his cup on his son? Have you poured out your gratitude on him? I try to do it every day for every drop of the cup that his son drank. How does he feel as he looks down on his son? I'm telling you, when you begin to look into the cup, you'll begin to feel the father's heart. You'll begin to feel his heartbeat. You'll begin to hear that thundering cry out of heaven that my son will be glorified on earth as he is glorified in heaven. He is glorified right now as the lamb in heaven. Isn't he? What do they sing in heaven? Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb as we sang tonight in several songs. He's worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he went to a cross and endured the Father's wrath in our place. 
He's so worthy. But how does the father feel when he looks down upon this earth and he sees how we've forgotten him? Rarely mentioning it. I mean, I've been put down so many times. I can't even tell you the stories. You can read it in my undone book of, of people saying, why do you preach about this? Stop teaching about this. I mean, leaders telling me, don't teach about this anymore. I don't want to hear you mentioning the. And then I don't talk about it all that much. Just, but if you give me, if you, if you give me a microphone, or you give me a class, or give me an opportunity to preach or teach, believe me, we're going to talk about it. But the father feels his heart pounds for his son to be honored, for the sacrifice that his son made and and that he made. But listen, I don't think this. I don't know if this has gotten to America yet, but it was thick in, in England. We go there just about every year. And there's a, a teaching that's gotten rampant in England that says the father is the ultimate child abuser. <sighs> because he punished his son. Because he had his son go to a cross. What does that do to the father? What does that do to him when he sacrificed his son for us? The very people that are accusing the father of abusing his son don't understand that he did it for you. There's no way you can be saved without blood. There's no way you can be saved without someone taking that wrath, without someone taking that punishment in your place. Because we've all sinned. We were born in sin, the fall of, of the human race. We've all sinned, and we needed a Savior to stand in the gap, and that's why this was planned before the creation of the world in the great covenant of redemption. When the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit agreed on this plan that the Son would pay this fathomless sacrifice for the sake of his bride, for the sake of a family, for God. And so I love what John Stott said. He said, Divine love triumphed over divine wrath by divine self-sacrifice. I want to take you now into a, a video. And as you look at this father, think of the father God. And as you see this son and the sacrifice that he makes, think about the son of God.
I know you love the cross, and I know you're committed to Jesus, but have you embraced it? Have you made it central? Have you put it in the center of your teaching, of your preaching, of, of your writing, of your worship, of whatever it is that God has called you to do? Can we stand, please? Just put your hand on your heart, if you would. Oh, Lord. Help us, Lord. To feel what you feel. 
to understand what you gave, to understand that simple but profound verse that God so loved the world. You, that God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. Have you made it your compelling passion to tell others? Or does fear hold you back? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you afraid? What if people reject you? So what? They rejected him. What if people abandon you? Everyone abandoned him, even his father. You say, but God, and some of you have said this at times. You've said, Father, you've cried alone in the night. And you said, where were you, God? Why have you forsaken me? Why did you let that happen to me? And all over the world, people shake their fist at God. And say, God, why did you allow the earthquake? Why do you allow the tsunamis with, with hundreds of thousands of people killed? Why do you allow that tornado in Oklahoma? Why do you allow the, the hurricanes, the destruction that's happening? And we blame God when Jesus paid it all. I want to give you something. We say, why, why, why? Jesus cried that same cry on the cross. Why? Have you forsaken me? But the question is not why. The question is what. What has God done about human suffering? What has God done? He gave his son, his eternal son, to drink his cup. To stand in our place and endure the punishment that we deserve for sin. That's what God did. And even before we move on, I just want you to again say this to the Lord. Say, Father, I'm sorry that sometimes I didn't understand. I blamed you. I blamed you when my husband left me. I blamed you when I suffered that physical ailment. I blamed you when that one I loved died. I blamed you. And I... I didn't understand that you gave everything and you never forsook me. Your son was forsaken so that I would never be forsaken by God. Some of you feel abandoned. Christ was abandoned so that you would never be abandoned by God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, I want to ask you tonight, are there people in this room? I realized last night, I mean, we were just beginning. But I asked you even then to come forward to make a commitment to the cross. But I really feel like tonight your heart's going to be fully in it. If you feel that way, would you come and make a fresh commitment, a fresh abandonment, a fresh embrace of the cross? Just come forward and fill this place in the front. And when you come, you're saying, God, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm not going to put everything else in front of you, in front of the cross, in front of the gospel. I'm not going to be ashamed anymore. I'm going to live my life. Some of you don't even understand the turmoil you've been going through. Is God, we're just trying to get you back where he wanted you, the center, the central place. God is shaking the earth. He's shaking America. He's shaking the nations. He's shaking the church because he wants to bring his son back to the center, the cross back to the center where the fire of revival burns because his son took it all. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Now, just talk to him right now. Talk to him. Tell him. Tell him how you feel. Tell, you, tell the Father how you feel. Tell him how you want to give yourself 
and embrace this beautiful cross, the Lamb of God. You want a revelation of the Lamb to pierce your heart, to envelop you, to come burned within you. Oh, God, make a fresh commitment tonight. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May I never lose my passion for the cross. I ask you to ignite a fresh passion in all of our hearts tonight. Some of you, it just depends on where you are. Some of you need to tell him you're sorry and ask him for a gift of repentance. Some of you did that last night. Some of you maybe still be doing it. And some of you just need to speak out that word of commitment and abandonment. Some of you need to tell him you're sorry that you've neglected to tell others. That you're, you've gotten so caught up with work and the cares of this world. And you've gotten tired, worn out. Let your heart be refreshed tonight. Oh, Jesus, just tell him.